everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're here with Holly and Jesse from the British Red Cross, um, they're filmmakers. So we're going to be talking to them today about what they do and what they're going to be doing in the future. So the first thing we'll do is we'll hand over to you, Holly. Um, could you give us a little bit of an introduction about who you are and what you do? OK, um, hello, I'm Holly. Um, I'm a uh, filmmaker currently working in house for the British Red Cross. Um, so I kind of work on content all across the board um, from uh, subjects such as trafficking through to first aid um, and have worked both in the UK and on international shoots. Um, and I'm also a documentary filmmaker as well um, and have recently co-founded a production company with Jesse uh, called Fig Films. Amazing. And Jesse, could you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Um, it's very, very similar. <laughs> I'm trying to think what the difference is. Uh, I think probably the only difference is that I um, have worked part time at the Red Cross um, for the last like couple of years. Um, and so have used the kind of extra time that I've had to kind of start doing some more independent films through big films. Um, but yeah, that's about the only difference between us, to be honest. Yeah, I'm much more a backseat driver of big films at the moment because I'm working full time um, for the British Red Cross. But yeah, Jesse's Jesse's done a lot in the last two years, I think, with Fig. That sounds really interesting. And I can't wait to sort of delve into the types of work that you guys have been creating. Um, so we'll get the first question out of the way that always pops up, which is gear. So could you talk to us a little bit about what gear you use? Holly, you just go first each time. That's easier. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. Um, so in-house with um, the Red Cross, we actually um, we have quite a stripped back kind of like core kit using C sort of a C100, Canon C100, um, usually with zoom lenses um, and um, a gimbal, kind of like a Ronin. Um, and that's our kind of go to kit that we use in like emergencies as well as like on international shoots because it's quite stripped back. Um, but occasionally we'll kind of do a larger shoot with a kind of shoot hire. Um, I also have my own personal kit. So I have an F. Sorry, my cat is here. <laughs> I um, have an uh, Sony FS5 um, uh, with like a variety of lenses. Um, again, very stripped back. Um, I think, yeah. I don't really have much more to say about the kit, I guess. Um, Jesse, do you have, what do you have? Uh, so I have um, a Sony a7 III kit. Um, so again, pretty stripped back, like radio mic, top bike, top bike, top mic. Um, and the Canon 24 to 70 lens uh, with the f-stop 2.8, I think it is. Um, so mainly because I do like self-shooting, but if I was to self-shoot, it would always be something quite paired back. Whereas like, I guess for other things, I would work with a DOP with something like an Alexa Mini or something like that. But I mean, I can't operate that myself. <laughs> it must be quite run and gun because obviously when you're on assignment, um, either personal projects or at the British Red Cross, I can't imagine you'd have a lot of time to sort of pack up and carry a red like around <laughs> different areas across the globe. Um, do you find the work is quite quick, um, that you're moving quite fast and that you're trying to sort of shoot quite run and gun style rather than sort of stand still interview type footage? Um, yeah. it, can, it can be really mixed, can't it? I mean, like um, when you're on an international shoot and often working kind of like quite high intense environments, you need to have that incredible, like immediate sort of like, kit that you can just you're, you're so familiar with as well I think familiarity is like a huge thing um where you're not like fiddling for buttons and like trying to figure out yeah just the various bits but um but then sometimes we do really stage things um so in wh where you do have that kind of freedom to be a bit more creative and as a result you can use kit slightly differently I think yeah I think the international stuff is a bit more run and gun just because I mean just like practically it's just like you can't be like lugging the kind of kit around that you would potentially for a more like studio shoot or something like that um 
but and yeah it would just be I guess also you're trying not to draw too much attention to yourself mm -hmm. as well um is yeah. another thing and then the, I, I guess there's also like the consideration as well as quite I mean most of the time we're filming with people who aren't being paid to kind of be with us and to um they're basically just very generously giving up their time and in that sense you have to be so considerate and kind of careful with with how much time you actually spend with them so if you can minimize that through like prep then all the better for, for everyone yeah I wonder so obviously the British Red Cross people have quite a common association as to the type of work that they do and I know from our previous conversations you were talking to the fact that there are a lot more things that the British Red Cross are involved in outside of the traditional aid that people see maybe across television or you know um through the internet I wondered Jesse maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the different types of work that the British Red Cross do or that you do with the British Red Cross yeah sure so it is kind of funny because I think obviously it's the British Red Cross but I think people mainly associate them us with international work um which we definitely do do but um often the international work is more our kind of like funding support for the equivalent of the British Red Cross in whatever country it is, like whether that's the Afghanistan Red Crescent or for example, like something recently, that would be like us doing an emergency appeal to give the Afghanistan Red Crescent money rather than like British Red Cross doing it necessarily. And then obviously, because of that, we then have our own stuff in the UK. And the, the idea behind it is that it's essentially whatever the biggest crises are in that country at that time. And so that can kind of change. So there's the emergency response element, which is always there where like the British Red Cross, so say, and it could be like a terrorist attack or it could be like a house fire or it could be flooding, but those volunteers will be there essentially to kind of fill that gap that like the kind of emergency services can't do which I guess is sort of the like practical and emotional support probably mostly and just making sure because mm. I guess it's that thing of like you know like say your house it, say you have a house fire and it's you know a bad one you know the police will sort of be there to find out how it happened obviously firefighters will put out the fire paramedics if anyone's injured but then there's that sense of like well what if you don't have anywhere to go or and obviously you're traumatized so if that's kind of the gap I guess that the Red Cross fill um and then aside from that it's um I'm pretty sure the biggest refugee service provider in the country so a lot of work with refugees and asylum seekers um a lot of work with like sort of supporting the NHS with kind of like um I guess getting people out of hospital making sure they're okay um anyone who's sort of socially isolated um I think that's probably the main oh and first aid's obviously a big one yeah and would you say then um so I hand over to you Holly for this question would you say that your work can be quite sort of immediate so maybe you, you wouldn't know where you're going next week um or is it quite planned out do you have sort of rotors and systems or is it very much reactive um for the most part it's actually planned out um I think yeah also yeah because there's just so much happening but often that that is a long-term there's so much long-term strategy um in the British Red Cross um um, another thing that I don't think Jesse mentioned is the uh, policy and advocacy work that goes that is a kind of undercurrent between all of this. So quite often um, the British Red Cross is, is trying to like affect kind of change in legislation and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, um, it's there's there's a lot of sort of forward thinking and planning. Um, so our work will be kind of mapped out in that sense. We all kind of um, Jesse, myself and the other um, multimedia producer kind of have very specific pockets of, of work that or focuses that we have um so it kind of works like that but what when there is an emergency that takes place um for instance the, the Beirut um or even like Covid um those kind of emergencies that kind of were very reactive um then if there's an appeal like an emergency appeal that will kind of happen then um the organization will kind of kick into like appeal mode or like emergency appeal mode 
and that work is very reactive and is very much kind of like on the day um sort of yeah you'll be given sort of a, a kind of focus or a task um I tend to personally like I tend to do the much more like long-term stuff rather than the reactive stuff I think Jesse you've worked a lot more on the reactive emergency um appeals um so yeah it can it can vary basically and it also might just because listeners might be interested um the kind of international red cross do actually now have um as part of their kind of delegates as they're called when an emergency happens so you'll get say like a water and sanitation delegate you'll get like just a, maybe more like a project management one for example um and they now have I think have recognized the need for like photo and video content of emergencies. So they now have an audio visual delegate, which works in the same way that when something like an earthquake happens, there'll be a call out and then you'll be kind of on a flight within 48 hours if you can do that rotation. Um, and sort of internal staff can kind of each year apply to get onto the kind of training to then be that delegate, um, which is something that I did a few years ago. And sadly, COVID sort of stopped um, any that whole kind of way of working, but it's sort of started up again now. So I'm really hoping to, at some point, maybe in the next year, be able to do a sort of deployment, as it were. Yeah. Could I ask how it feels to be able to tell these people's stories? Because I think visually, it's very difficult for somebody to emotively relate to something without being able to visualise it. And obviously part of your careers is to help them visualize what's happening and and sort of tell those stories to provoke emotion in other people and and to inspire help how does it feel being involved in those sorts of projects do you want to go first Jessie yeah um I think it's just it's something that you have to be so kind of careful and considered about like always and we're kind of constantly which is a really good thing having like conversations around consent and constantly sort of reflecting on maybe when something hasn't gone so well what we can learn from that um and I think particularly in those kind of international circumstances I think there's even more room for that to go wrong because there's just more you know there's tends to be people who are probably kind of traumatized the language barrier I think the fact that so often there can be kind of people that you're talking to that wouldn't necessarily understand the idea of their kind of video going on social media and then that being able to be seen by everybody. Um, and I think also there's that thing of never wanting someone to think that they have to do it to get the aid. And I think that's like the real kind of thing that you never ever want someone to think um yeah. because they just see the red cross uniform and don't necessarily differentiate between us being like an audio visual person and then the person over there who's handing out you know food parcels or whatever it might be um so i think it's just being really 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 clear up front and also making it very very clear that they can change their mind at any time and trying your best to get some kind of follow up, which is sometimes more hard, like more difficult than others. But um, yeah, it's something that's very important to us for obvious reasons. Yeah, I suppose like on a personal level of actually like being able to meet these people, being able to listen, it, it feels like such a privilege to be able to to actually, it, you know, obviously once the sort of consent is there is there and, and a kind of clear understanding on both sides of what what the uh, purpose of kind of doing any kind of content with that person is once you get kind of like past that and you actually are creating something with them it, it feels incredible like just to be able to 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 do that with someone um is just such a privilege I think yeah absolutely and um- it must be quite rewarding when you do have a story that you can tell and it works and people do then start to you know donate and and to pay attention to these causes I can imagine it it's sort of quite a nice feeling to know that you are making a difference to those people and, and being able to tell their stories and I guess my next question would be when you're shooting these in these moments in these environments there must be quite a plethora of emotions going through your head um, and I wonder for a lot of people who are thinking of getting into 
journalism, documentary, news, anything along those lines. How do you prepare for these moments in terms of your mental health? And then I guess, how do you recover from them as well? Mm. <laughs> I think with, I mean, with the Red Cross, because um, it's such a larger organisation as well, um, they're very, very good at um, sort of mapping that out for you um, before and after in that sense. So um, in international deployments in high risk areas, for instance, you will have to go undergo specific training to prepare for that. So um, you might have to do something like hostile environment um, awareness training. And then afterwards, um, if you've personally been quite affected by that deployment, um, they do offer therapy um, aftercare, which is very important um, to sort of have available. Um, I think on a personal level, um, I think it's just about sort of a, trying to try. You have to kind of establish your own boundaries, I think. Yeah um it's really important to be sensitive and almost like vulnerable to those situations to empathize Emp empathy is like the biggest tool I think in those scenarios but it's also about making sure that you can give what you can give and do that without damaging yourself to some degree yeah. um that might sound quite vague I don't know <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that is really important though. Mm. It's like being able to, yeah, because I think there is sometimes quite a bit of guilt. Like I remember coming back from, this was a Medicine Sans Frontier one rather than Red Cross, but it was at um, like a sexual violence clinic for girls yeah. affected by child marriage. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, it was, that, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And it was, yeah, I think coming back to then like your life, it was it was just really kind of like like I remember going to a friend's birthday and like it was quite soon after I'd got back and you know people were just like as as we do you know moaning about certain things and like I found it re I was found myself being really angry and then I had to kind of you know remind myself that it is all relative and like you know they haven't you know it's not my friend's fault that that's happening and um but yeah, it is, you know, it is hard because you sort of see how unjust the world can be and um, yeah. not to sound kind of pious about it, but like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's definitely an eye-opening experience to go to like sort of those kind of places, I think. Yeah, it must be quite a juxtaposition sort of coming back from a deployment like that straight into, like you said, the sort of modern life that we now live where it's like, oh, like Prosecco and brunches. Mm. Um, and it's easy, I think, for people to forget that there is such a, a contrast. Um, I guess a follow up question from what you've mentioned is, are there any projects that you've done that you felt were sort of, I don't want to say your favourites, it makes it sound like they were sort of fun. But what I mean is, is, is there projects for you that stood out as things that you were really glad that you were involved in and stories that you were really happy that you were able to tell for these people? uh I think well I, I think like the the most important thing I've done or it was yeah I, I so the most the, the the thing that resonates most on to that question I guess is so I, I went to Syria on a deployment for two weeks um yeah. at the end of 2018 and I think that that was I think like a life-changing sort of experience really um and yeah I think I don't really know <laughs> what, what specifically to say about it other than I think it, it was a very it was like a very important trip I think and and we've we managed to get um we managed to be able to sort of capture very um uh yeah we we've basically uh captured really like sort of hard-hitting but like important um stories and um I think they they the people that we filmed with were also very grateful to to be able to have someone from the outside kind of listening um and shining a bit of a light on um a slice of life in Syria that isn't necessarily shown in the news as well um so to have the sort of um experience of that is was something that will sort of last 
yeah that like stay with me forever um so yeah I think that would be mine really yeah absolutely um I think mine's probably more generally working with refugees and asylum seekers in the UK um like I've done quite a few different sort of films and stuff with them like that was one um about a asylum seeker who had been detained um and he was kind of talking about essentially that experience um and it was to kind of help well hopefully to help with um the policy and advocacy side of people being detained in the UK um which to me is one of the most cruel things that kind of happens in this country um and I think yeah I think there are a community of people that are obviously so vilified and you know to get to work with them and just spend time with them and not that I thought this before but you just sort of the more do, the more you do it the more ridiculous you kind of see how it is you know how we with it obviously they're just people like anybody else who want to contribute and you know make friends work you know and try and start a new life after being through horrific things and so I think yeah being able to kind of I guess meet them through the work which I might not necessarily have been able to do just in my own life um yeah I think that's probably mine yeah and I think it's really incredible that not only yourselves but everybody that's working there is putting aside their own sort of like emotive responses in order to give these people a voice and a platform that quite frankly they they deserve um you know their stories are so important for people to learn about and like you said it hopefully will de vilify these people um and present a more human tone um so yeah i mean i, I think you guys are doing amazing work um so I guess one of the things you mentioned briefly there, Holly, was Syria. And we have this question quite a lot that comes up, especially with uh, filmmaking, news, journalism, documentary. How was it being female in those types of environments? Because I think there's quite a, I don't want to say myth, but there's quite a misconception that women can't do this work because of those types of travel and situations that you end up in. And obviously you have done it. As you said, it was really life changing for you. And I just wonder if you could give us a bit more of an open perspective on why you can do that if you're a sort of young female looking to break into this industry a little more. That's a really good question because it it's something that's never even crossed my mind for some reason. <laughs> I've never thought, oh, I'm a woman and um, I can't do that. <laughs> um, I, it's interesting because I, I mean, I went out with another um, woman from my team along with another another um, man. So it was a free person sort of British Red Cross team traveling out there. Um, and actually, like we were working with quite a lot of women sort of in the Syrian Red Crescent side. Um, and so it just it hadn't even. Yeah, it's not even crossed my mind that that would um, that it felt unusual in any sense. But um, it, I just. Yeah, I, I guess just it, I guess at the end of the day, it's just about what you're passionate about and the 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 stories that you want to tell. Like, just go for it. I, I mean, I don't think. Hopefully, there shouldn't really be anything st stopping you. And and, and I I don't think actually when I was there, like I didn't get a sense. Um, maybe I was very re removed from things, but I didn't get a sense of it being unusual of being a woman behind the camera um, in that environment. Um, so, but yeah, perhaps I'm, perhaps I just wasn't noticing, <laughs> noticing anything, but yeah, it, it, it's, um, <clears throat> I, I would just say at the end of the day, it's just about, if, I mean, I just, if you're an empathetic person and, and have a kind of passion, I'd say just, yeah, just try and go for it. Mm. I think also if there are any prejudices, wherever we're talking about, then I think just use them to your advantage. That's what I've always done. Just if mm. there's, if I've ever been in a situation where I think it's, then I just sort of play up to it a bit and be like, you know, yeah. act a little bit like, oh, I'm just a silly, naive woman. Yeah. And you get more, it's actually then becomes less of a threat, like to tell what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, and actually, 
when I was, so I went out to, I've been shooting in, I had shot in Bangladesh three times in over the course of the year, um, shooting on a female empowerment project. And I did have a few women sort of say to me that they were, it was amazing that I was a woman doing this. And that was really inspiring for them, I suppose, to sort of see a woman behind the camera telling a female led story, which was really cool. So I think it's nice to sort of know that if you're doing that, it kind of helps other people feel more reassured about taking that path. Yeah, I think it's it's really good to hear both of your perspectives on it, because a lot of the time there is this sort of, like I say, a misconception that it's too dangerous or um, my favourite one is always that cameras are too heavy. Uh, <laughs> and so it's really good to sort of see people like yourselves going to these places and being able to tell those stories and not even noticing because it isn't a problem. It's a completely non-problem um, for people who are looking to do it. Um, so I guess my next question for you, so we've talked quite a lot about your work with the British Red Cross. As you mentioned at the start, we also um, have heard that you're sort of creating your own passion website and projects that you're filming together. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how that started and more about what it involved. How did it start, Jesse? <laughs> I think it was actually a panic, to be honest. But it was me panicking because basically I won some funding um, to make uh, the short film The Forgotten Sea. Um, and basically you had to do it, which you do, like, you know, when you get kind of industry funding, so industry film funding, you do have to run it through a limited company because obviously you can't just put it in your own personal account because it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. So I'd sort of won this money <laughs> and then just panicked because I was like, I don't have a company. And I mean, I'm the producer, so it's kind of my job. Like, I, you know, some I have to do something. Um, so then it sort of steamrolled this process where I think it must have, I think we must have been maybe more vaguely talking about it and how it could be really cool. But then I think that, yeah. And then I think that basically had to steamroll it literally <laughs> out of just necessity. So then we kind of started it and like, it was kind of hilarious in a way because obviously <laughs> it's quite a big deal starting a company, but I think it was just sort of like, I just, you know, you just, I, mean, I was just like, I just need to do it. So I'm just, you know, let's just do it. And then we'll just kind of <laughs> our way through. Um, and then I think it's it, like, that is what we did. So we started it and then I had the funding through it and then have since had um, another two, two or three sort of industry film funding through it as well now. Um, but it's only kind of recently that we've actually, I guess, taken a bit of a step back and like really looked at like, when we've had a bit of downtime like okay like what are our responsibilities as company directors like what do we need to do you know and kind of come up with a bit of a strap more of a strategic kind of um yeah like uh plan um so yeah so it was <laughs> I just say go for it it's actually really easy to set up a limited company. It's, an, it's kind of ridiculously easy to set up a limited company it it's scary really easily it's scary really easily but it was nice because it felt it was just like an organic thing that just kind of came out of it was like yeah as Jesse said like we had been talking about it for some time but it was actually like something happened that kind of made it happen in a sense but it it's sort of been a sort of slow growth um, over like that space of time in terms of us like thinking about it a bit more about what we want to do and how we want to kind of approach it together um, which is very it's been very nice. Could you tell us a little bit about the types of films that you're making sort of in this this pursuit? Um, I just wonder is it very similar to the work that you do already? Is it quite different? So I guess at the moment because we do still work for the Red Cross it's um I guess more the kind of independent passion personal projects um, to kind of go alongside the Red Cross work. Um, but we've kind of recently decided that, I think because we're both driven by a kind of impact and a certain kind of way of filmmaking, I think we kind of came up with a bit of a, well, we've kind of called it a manifesto that, I think has really helped us sort of frame what we want to do and how we want to do it. Um, 
which you can see on our new website. <laughs> um, Bigfilms.co.uk. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say it's probably summarised by, I think, I don't know, it sounds a bit glib, but I think, I guess like impact driven, working kind of with underrepresented communities and not in a way that's like, kind of you know like tropes about giving voice to the voiceless or anything like that it's much more like a collaborative kind of co-production kind of way um and working with say for example like people of color who are directors um to tell whatever story they want rather than necessarily you know because i think often people are kind of shoehorned into doing something that wider society sees as like their kind of issue yeah. um which I think is part of the problem um so yeah maybe check out the manifesto because we're quite proud of it actually and like it's a good way of holding ourselves to account I think by putting it in writing publicly yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. like yeah and, and focusing on like focusing making sure that you're focused on the core values of what it is you want to make and how you want to make it is really important I think um yeah. and also like yeah we're really keen on on kind of whatever story it is we end up working on with with a community or with a person it, it's kind of also making sure it's something that they want to say rather than shoehorning them into making them say what we think they want to say or what people expect them to say mm. um, and that can be like not just like words but just like even the subject matter of what it is we're filming it's like yeah quite often you'll see sort of content on um specific groups but you see like a very specific sliver of their life and yeah. and that's because that's what the audiences apparently want to see rather than actually what they want to be talking about and you know focusing on themselves so that's really important for us as well and I think growing the company too to actually be representative of those people as well like we were really I saw a talk as part of the BFI women with a movie camera summit that was really cool that was basically like a history of female film collectives um mm -hmm. and it was kind of all about I guess kind of values of like community collaboration like equality and like you know rather than sort of doing it in a way that's more about I guess like profit it was much more about kind of like working together to combine skills and kind of help each other out um and I think that was really inspiring and I think is definitely an approach that we would love to take sort of like over the years of like not just being like we're going to tell these stories but actually like yeah. grow it to be you know more people to be part of it. Yeah I think writing a manifesto is a beautiful way to solidify your values as a company um, but also as you as you mentioned you know building those communities it has become really important and I think we are now seeing a movement of different people speaking about their work rather than the same people over and over again. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, I mean, for me personally as a woman as well, to see more women in these areas of film and in these areas that are maybe not stereotypically the ones that we were used to see them in. Um, we have actually had a really good question come in from Tom Hill Film. Hello, Tom. Um, he's asked what your backgrounds were. So how did you get into filmmaking in the first place? Um, I guess before you even ventured into the British Red Cross. Okay. Uh, so I got into filmmaking because I had just left uni uh, doing a bit of a dead end degree. Um, I shouldn't really say that. Well, I mean, it was... <laughs> It was, a, it was a wonderful degree, don't get me wrong, but it, it didn't have a kind of direct direction. So I, I did film and English studies, which was fantastic. Um, but, you know, I kind of left uni thinking, what now? Spent three years sort of um, trying to figure that out. Ended up working for the counts, uh, for the local council I was, I was in, um, uh, doing a communications internship and sort of in, in, I had always been really interested in visual, visual arts had always been, really passionate about photography did a lot of film photography um people saying you should go into photography and I was like no I don't want to sort of disrupt my passion um <laughs> and then sort of did this communications internship and then um was started thinking about being a social worker but kind of explored that knew it wasn't really for me um 
just because I, I think it would have been a bit too, I was just a bit too sensitive, I suppose. And you have to be a very sort of rock solid, I think, to be able to, to do the, the, that kind of amazing work. And um, ended up having, I went on an assignment for this communications internship to do some filming, just because I mentioned I was really passionate about um, photography and ended up uh, filming this thing called a slipper swap, <laughs> where older p- people swap in their um, old slippers for new slippers and just went around interviewing them and like filmed them and like made a little film for the council. And I just was like, I stayed up really late, like editing it. I was just like so passionate about it. And I was just like, oh my God, this is it. Like, it's all about yeah. filmmaking and chatting to people. And I was just like, documentary, ah. So then, yeah, it was just like this huge revelation about this event. Um, and it just suddenly kind of made sense. Like documentary filmmaking is a kind of marriage between between like, yeah, the sort of creative side, but also the kind of active listening and active um, sort of observing and documentation. And I've always been really passionate about that side of things and like trying to preserve people, preserve their stories, preserve like just them. And so then I ended up doing a um, master's at UCL uh, called Ethnographic and Documentary Filmmaking um, uh, and sort of took it from there. So that's my long winded long winded way in. Thank God for the slipper swap, eh? Hey? Thank God for yeah. the slipper swap. <laughs> um, and I was quite similar-ish. I also did um, English Lit and Film Studies, um, but I went straight into a master's, um, partly because I didn't quite know what to do, but I had this feeling. So it was a master's in documentary journalism. But I mean, to be honest, a lot of the reason was because you got like a massive bursary if you went straight into a master's from third year um, at the same uni. Uh, And then so I did this documentary journalism master's and then was quite was taught by this kind of anarchist lecturer, which like really changed my like perspective on everything because he, I guess, taught us in a way that was like things about power structures and it just really opened my eyes to like, I guess, politics and socialism, (laughs) Um, (laughs) which then has kind of informed what I've done since. And then I then managed to get, a. um, I don't think these exist anymore, they might do, but um, it was a creative skill set traineeship for six months with a documentary production company. Um, I then had a Oh no, then I did, um, I managed to get like a camera assistant, edit assistant role, which I actually got fired from (laughs) because I was really shit at it. It was kind of fair enough, but um, like, I just hated it. It was just like for like, kind of, it was sort of corporate films, like for things like, I don't know, just like stuff that I didn't care about. And then I think that kind of gave me a bit of a crisis in confidence because I was like, oh my God, I've got fired from my first job in film. <laughs> what? Um, but then I think I sort of realised that it was maybe that it wasn't that I didn't want to do film. It was that I didn't want to do that kind of film. Um, yeah. And then I had, and then I managed to get an internship, um, a video production internship with Medicine Sans Frontier. And then that was kind of then the start of that. Like I was with them for a while, progressed to kind of assistant video producer, then got the job at the Red Cross and then um, went part time a couple of years ago and then have started doing the kind of independent stuff. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think it's really good to to note that, you know, it doesn't always work out perfectly straight from, you know, I walked into the BBC straight after university, like so rare. Oh. <laughs> also, I forgot actually, I had a whole year of just like doing like temp receptioning. I then, I worked at the picture house as like a kind of customer service. Um, and I must have applied until I got that. I think that was why I was so gutted about being fired yeah. because it had taken me a year to get that kind of first job in film. And yeah. I'd applied to so many. I mean, I must have applied to like, hundreds of jobs and didn't get them so and then I think that was why it was so gutting to them be fired (laughs) which is why I was just like oh god what am I doing um but yeah just follow your instincts I think and you will get there 
that's the thing like both you and I Jesse I think had brainwave moments of like mm-hmm. this is it like this is definitely the bit of filmmaking that we want to be in for you it was like I guess like MSF and like actually like finally like mm. realizing it was about kind of it wasn't just filmmaking in general and just like yeah. cameras and tech it was about like being with the people and actually like sort of working with people and, and actually like doing that kind of stuff as opposed to just film yeah um, yeah and I yeah. guess for me it was slippers <laughs> no, I, think, I think it's really nice to hear the story of how you guys got there because it is an interesting thing that I think from a distance always seems so unachievable um but we've all we've all been there we've all worked normal jobs I mean I used to work in a bar so <laughs> the joys um <laughs> So I guess my next question for you um, would be in terms of places you'd love to go or stories you'd love to tell, whether that's passion or with the British Red Cross, is there anything that you haven't done yet that you're like, yes, I really, really want to go and do this and I really want to tell that story? That's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, I've got, I got, I have a project that I had to let go that I have put on the shelf um I was developing during my MA uh, and definitely bit off way more than I could chew um that was based in a prison I can't really say much more than that just because I'm quite, quite precious about the the topic I guess but um yeah that's the kind of that's always been the sort of I that's always been the sort of project I've wanted to return to when I'll have the opportunity to um and probably is still too much to bite off than I can chew. But um, but I think, yeah, it's, I, f- I feel like this happens with filmmakers actually, where you will always have like that one that you kind of want, you've been thinking about and has always maybe been quite difficult, but you'll kind of re- return to it. I've heard of that quite a lot actually. Um, yeah. But it's quite, it's quite nice to have something that you have as a kind of, as a goal um, yeah. that you can kind of, that yeah that you feel is is a story really worth pursuing and worth telling yeah absolutely <clears throat> I don't know. um yeah I think there's unfinished projects for sure um yeah nothing sticks out there's definitely those sort of unfinished projects that you can't you've sort of maybe half started or like it's kind of in your head and yeah there's a lot of them <laughs> yeah and then it's sort of like there's something about them that you can't quite like I've had loads of ideas which I've then just completely mm-hmm. ended up forgetting about which obviously just weren't you know like because that's I think how it works but there's definitely some that kind of stay lingering in your mind and for whatever reason they haven't quite come but there's something about them that you're like there is something here it's just maybe not quite the right moment yeah it's always interesting to see the contrast between filmmakers and photographers because for photographers it's always the shot that they missed or yeah. they, they didn't have their camera and for filmmakers it's always that project that they never quite finished that they the story they didn't quite tell mm. um, Tom says thank you that's a it's a great journey um so you're welcome Tom uh, <laughs> and my final question of the day is what's next for both of you and um, what are you seeing in the future or what are you planning on doing? <laughs> um, I am developing an idea for a feature documentary um, and also a, I haven't quite worked out whether it's a narrative feature or whether it's more like, I think it's probably a TV series, I think. It's, um, but they're the two projects at the moment that I'm, really want to like try and actually carve out some time which I think sometimes is the hardest that bit where you're like maybe you're not making money out of it and it really is that kind of just developing it but you do need to have that time um so I'd really like to prioritize that I think maybe for like the end of the year early next year and just sort of maybe not take on so much stuff so that I can actually write some things yeah yeah, and we're we're also looking at some, uh, well, one one funding, um, f- one fund in particular um, that we're thinking of sort of writing a uh, proposal for as well. So that would be um, if that was to be something that we went for, and and um, 
sort of was accepted for then we would uh be making that I guess next year it'd be a sort of short documentary um uh I guess for me I'm so I'm very much sort of yeah full-time um at the Red Cross so I for me I'd like just to my my aspiration is to sort of continue the sort of um work where I can with FIG um and I think my approach to that is probably like seeking the funding opportunities and then then sort of conceptualizing something around that um that I think could work just a slightly different approach to the kind of more proactive stuff I guess um but I guess like in general like for me like we've touched on this before but like my I think co-production in 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 whatever way is just like I think the goal in terms of like the stuff that I want to be making and continue to make is is making sure it kind of consistently takes that approach um and like the Red Cross is is definitely going in that direction which is fantastic and we've we've done some really brilliant projects that have um had a co-produced um method behind them um so yeah I'm just very much looking forward to to exploring that further well thank you both so much for sharing with us I've popped your website for fig films in the chat so if anybody wants to have a look at more work or what's coming up you can see it there um so yeah thank you both for joining us for anybody watching obviously this week is our change the image series um and we're celebrating leading female creatives who are working to change the narrative and tell stories that are really crucial for the globe and for people to understand. Um, you can join us this afternoon at four where we'll be talking to Alice Tomlinson about storytelling through stills. So um, very similar in terms of her project matter, but uh, with photography. Um, or you can join us tomorrow to talk to um, Bat, who has been working on a series with a lady who's moved from Afghanistan. Um, so thank you so much both. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, and we will see you on our next talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>